Sweet white violet, bird's foot violet, bird's foot violet grows uh, on the twin lines in Colored Row, and you'll see that each year. That's more of a bluish than a violet uh, color. Now, I mentioned, uh, talked a little bit about birds before, but um, I said I would come back to it, and there's 200 species of birds. 82 of those species actually nest in the park. We have a lot of, of warblers that are nesting right now, yellow throats, yellow warblers, pine warblers. Um, the hummingbirds are around, they are nesting now. Of the 200 species of birds, there are some endangered and threatened species. The peregrine falcon is here from time to time. Uh, the pied-billed grebe, which is a bird, a duck-like bird, that you see each winter, wintering over, but in the last couple years, it's actually staying here for the summer and uh, raising young. So that's, that's uh, pretty unique. And we're seeing more and more of the eagles uh, in the park. There's another 15 uh, species of birds that are of, of special concern. And Kinnekot is an important bird area. It's uh, important not only because of the breeding birds, but for migratory birds. We get a tremendous amount of birds coming through this area, uh, going back and forth to Central and South America each year. One of the rarest uh, insects that we have here is the buck moth, uh, a species that you see uh, in the fall uh, flying around. It lays eggs that winter over. The caterpillars hatch in the spring, and then they, uh, they'll spend a lot of time underground, especially during fire season. They'll wait until fires come by, and then they'll, they'll come out. So it's a very interesting uh, species. Now, as I mentioned, as you've seen from this, I've, I've talked about biodiversity, how there's all different kinds of, of species. And this is just summarizes the uh, number of different types of organisms that we have here. There's a hundred woody plants. In other words, a hundred species of trees and shrubs and vines that uh, can be found at, at Connecticut. Twelve species of ferns. 325 species of wildflowers. A lot of people don't realize how many different, different species there are. Uh, 24 herps, which is your reptiles and amphibians, your snakes and salamanders and turtles. There are 50 species of butterflies that uh, have been documented here. Uh, there's 25 species of mammals. We talked about some of the more common ones, but there's all, uh, I don't know how many people know that there's mink on the grounds that live here. Uh, the mink live along the, the, the river. Every once in a while I see a dead one out on Sunrise Highway. Last winter with all the snow I was able to, to document tracks of mink uh, right uh, at Lower Brook. Um, weasel here. There's, uh, everybody's familiar with moles. They are in your gardens and your, your lawns sometimes. But there's a rare mole here called the star nose mole that lives in your wetlands and it actually swims in the streams, turn, overturns rocks and eats the insects in the bottom of the, the, the stream. Uh, shrews and moles and different species of mice, so lots and lots of different things here. Um, bats, several species of bats, um, muskrat, of course raccoons and possum, I mean, just the list goes on and on. And there's 20 species of, of fish. We're familiar with the, the trout, but uh, there's uh, mud minnows and sticklebacks and a rare fish called the pirate perch. There's a little black fish that's, uh, a, I believe it's a threatened species uh, here. Now I've been here, as I said earlier, for over 35 years on this particular site and I have seen changes. Uh, over the years. Some of those changes um, are changes to the plant communities. Uh, we're st I've started to see a lot more of the hickories showing up here. And if you suppress fires enough, prevent fires from occurring, you're going to get hickories starting to come in. Also hollies. We're starting to see a lot more of the American hollies. 
And one of the biggest changes that I've seen is this little creature. Ticks. We, when I started here in 1973, and once in a while you get a tick on you. We used to have school groups all the time and ticks were really not that prevalent. They were here but not to the degree they are now. Going back to the ice house, global warming, climate change, I really firmly believe that because of our mild winters, we don't have those cold, dry winters that we used to have, the ticks are able to survive and reproduce. And we're seeing a lot more now than we ever have before, because you don't have that winter die off. We're starting to see the new, a new species of tick, which is almost more prevalent than the deer tick that's here, and that's the Lone Star tick. The Lone Star tick hits strides on birds. And as birds migrated, they took a ride from Texas to Long Island and uh, got dropped here and, and start, start breeding here. And the other thing I want to say about um, global warming and climate change is really more of an issue of climate change. Climate change, just because it's going to get warmer, doesn't mean that it's going to get drier. As a matter of fact, the northeast, where we're living now, is supposed to become rainier. We're supposed to be seeing a lot more precipitation. So, yeah, you'll get lots more snows during the winter, a lot more rains at, at this time of year. And that can change the whole ecology of, of the area. The, the heritage report that we looked at briefly at the beginning, uh, not only did they document the rare plant communities, the rare plants that are here, but they also identified threats to the biodiversity here. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but Konequat is the second most significant site for rare plants and plant communities in New York State. It's, it's a truly a unique area. Now, there are things that can change that, that can cause die-offs, changes in the forest, changes in the plants. One is a lack of fire. If we don't have fire here, you're not going to maintain the pine barrens. But because we are surrounded by communities, we have to control fire. Uh, so that leads us to looking at, well, is there a way that we might be able to do some controlled burns to maintain plant communities? Um, one of the things that's identified here is the fragmentation of the forest here that's caused by all the, tra the trails and fire lanes. Um, a lot of birds like huge, large, contiguous Space, uh, areas of forest. If you start to break them up, then you get other species. You get foxes, which prey on birds. You get uh, cowbirds, which is a bird that will lay its eggs in other birds' nests, letting the other birds raise their young. Uh, and essentially, when that baby cowbird is born in another bird's nest, it kicks out the youngsters of those warblers. Usually, it's warblers and takes over the nest. So fragmentation is a, is a serious issue, but you know, when you're, to protect the areas from fires, you're building fire lanes, but at the same time, you're, you're kind of ruining the, the, the ecology of the area. So it's, a, it's not an easy answer to do. And one of the things that we're looking at is uh, using fire to burn certain areas so that if a fire was coming towards Pond Road or Sycamore Avenue, you would burn the understory or the extra fuel, which would benefit the forest and also benefit the community in that you wouldn't have to worry about this wildfire getting into the, into the community. So those are some of the challenges that, that are being looked at. Erosion from trails causing uh, sedimentation, especially within the wetlands. You know, you don't have people staying on trails. Uh, it's not too bad occasionally you get horseback riders that aren't staying on the fire lanes. They start walking through. Uh, the wetland trails and they, they cause erosion and inadvertently probably uh, stepping on plants that, that can cause uh, problems. Uh, and the global warming issue we've, we've talked about. Global warming will res result in sea level rise, which is going to push the saltwater wedge up the Konequat River, and it's going to change the whole landscape of what we see here. Instead of a freshwater wetlands, you're going to have estuaries.